I mean, what inspired you to join, to even think of joining special forces or how did that, what was the impetus behind that? In 1967, I was in Hawaii trying to get away from my draft board, okay. which was back in Iowa. All right. And I was, I was uh, working out on the west side of the island of Oahu wow. for a fellow who was relocating uh, military housing off, off its base to another location, and he was going to uh, rent them out. And so I had a board and room job right. to help him uh, renovate and restore those buildings. And while I was out there, uh, he had a friend who was a special forces sergeant, hmm. and I can't remember his name, but he was doing training uh, special forces troops out there on the west side of Hawaii, hmm. some scuba stuff and stuff like that. And so I was really impressed with him. Yeah. Wow. So uh, I'll just continue here, if you don't mind. Uh, well, I was out there, it's mostly a Samoan area that was in this area where I was. And mm -hmm. uh, I had all my stuff in one of these units and uh, I, got, I got ripped off of all of my stuff, my tape recorder, my clothes and everything. Yeah. So I decided it was time for me to enlist in the army. <laughs> so I didn't have anything else to do. Mm -hmm. So I went down to Fort DeRussi and I was uh, enlisted Enlisted in the army at Fort Derussi, which if you've never been there, it's kind of a recreation place on Waikiki Beach. Wow. Yeah. So uh, uh, did that all the stuff to get inducted there and uh, went from there to do my basic training at Fort Ord, mm -hmm. California. And I did my AIT at Fort Ord as a radio operator. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, I went to Fort Benning uh, for jump school and finished that just three weeks at Fort, Fort Benning. Right. And from there, I went to Fort Bragg for uh, special forces training, enlisted training. So did you have to, just to pause there, so did you have to raise your hand for that or did you have, been, uh, did you have a decision to whether... What I you volunteered. Do or what, what made you kind of? Well, when I went, when I enlisted, they asked me, you know, what do you want to do in the Army? Yeah. And I told them I wanted to be in Special Forces. Okay. And, and what was it about? You said that one NCO, and you said impressed you. What, yes. what was it about? That seemed like a memorable. He was just a super guy. He was friendly. Uh -huh. And uh, he was and fit, he was very athletic and in very good shape. And he had a wife and, and kids out there and we had some barbecues together and I just became very good friends with him. Yeah, okay, all right. So from Fort Benning, I went to Fort Bragg and went to a training group. Uh, I'm still a listed man at this time. Right. And I graduated from the training group and, and I, I was assigned to become a medic so from Fort Bragg, I went down to the Special Forces Medic course in right. San Antonio at Fort Sam Houston. Wow. And that was a very long course. I'm told the medic course was the longest of any, longer than engineers or yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. And I had, uh, I was married at the time and uh, my wife and I rented an apartment uh, in San Antonio, not too far off the base, and mm -hmm. went through that medic training. Wow. What so made I, you, did you choose medic, or was that chosen for you, or what, what, what factors? In college, to, in college yeah. I was pre-med. Oh, okay. Wow. And uh, mm -hmm. so I, I just kind of motivated to do that. Yeah, okay. So uh, that was nine months, I think, down in San Antonio at Fort Sam wow. Houston. Yeah. And then from there, we went back to Fort Bragg for the completion of the medical training. And uh, that's where the dog lab was. We had to, we had to shoot a dog in his leg mm. and uh, practice uh, cleaning the wound and healing the wound. Yeah. We lived with that dog for a while. Wow. Yeah. 
So I finished uh, my medic uh, training and I, uh, my wife was pregnant at the time and I was on orders for NAM. Wow. And so I decided I'd apply to go to OCS. Oh, okay. So that's- To prolong a trip over the pond. Yeah. And- did you, um, did you, you know, with medical training, did you then form a team in training in special forces? Any, any memories of, of, you know, that part of your training? Oh, I made very, a lot of good friendships. Yeah. Uh, there was a any, fellow- any, any memorable, most memorable experiences of, of being in the training pipeline, you know, a pro selection process. I know you talked about medical, but that other other piece that, that you do, that you did. I made very good friends. As a matter of fact, one of the one of the fellows that was in my medic class has received the Medal of Honor wow. for his service in Vietnam. Wow. Uh, so anyway. I went to then I went to OCS. Yeah. You know, and I went to the engineer OCS in Fort Melbourne, Virginia. So you never really served as a as enlisted in special forces. You went right. Well, I was enlisted until I went to OCS. Okay. And my rank at OCS, I think, was uh, E5. Okay. And uh, you know, OCS is another six months. Right. <laughs> I had to keep my chin in the whole yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. I remember the attack officers there saying, do you think this program is a joke? And I said, sort of. And I did a lot of push-ups. <laughs> yeah. Since I had been enlisted as a special force as an enlisted man, I, I, uh, I think they looked to me for some more leadership in the, in the OCS class. Right. They called you us be, being, um, you know, did you have any memorable experiences in an SF unit or team at, you know, before you became an officer? I guess I'm just. No. Or, or you just, you went almost straight. I went straight, school. straight from training group or the medic course on to OCS. OCS. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, so keep going. They All call right. us beans there. And beans. what I remember about it, bean heads, you know, because yeah. we had no air again. Mm -hmm. And uh, every two months, you had to rank your class from one to how many number we had. I think we had 20 in my class. Right. Yeah. And if, if, you, uh, if you ranked low in that peer review, you got kicked out. Three wow. of us got kicked out for every yeah. peer review. Wow. And then, of course, she went straight to Vietnam. Wow. So when I first started doing peer review, I scored real high. But toward the end of the program, I scored lower. <laughs> hmm. I don't know. I had behavior problems. Okay. I guess. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think the OCS was six months. And from there, uh, I got assigned. They said at OCS, you should write. You, write a letter as to what you want to do as an officer, as a second, new second lieutenant. Right. So I wrote a letter and it got sent to someplace and I was assigned to the, back to Fort Bragg uh, to work as, work in, as a G5 section for a colonel. And I was called the deputy G5 working for this colonel in the 82nd Airborne Division. Hmm. And uh, I was in charge of, uh, the 82nd, 82nd Airborne Museum, right there on, in, on the Fort Bragg. Okay. Yeah. I did that for about three months. And I, you know, everything was so strack and you had to have your shoes polished. And I was saluting all the time. I just wanted to get back to Smoke Bomb Hill. Right. So I, yeah. That's where the Special Forces is, of course. Sure. And so I went to the officer's course there at, at, uh, at Smoke Bomb Hill and uh, finished that. What was that like then? So you, so there was a, what was kind of the general time frame that you went through? This was special forces qualification course, right? Right for the officer course. Yeah, yeah. And I think I graduated. I got my looking my notes here. I think I graduated in September of 1969. Okay, all right. And, and I got from there. I got assigned to the third special forces group. Right. Any any particular um, standout experiences? 
during that school or anything that comes to mind about? Most of the training was online or correspondence type training, sure, you know? Sure. It wasn't online. It was like correspondence courses. Okay. Well, I, I, I don't recall. I don't recall much face-to-face -face instruction in the officer course. Okay. So I was in the third group, assigned to the third group and for a very short time and then came on orders to go to Vietnam. My wife went back to Iowa to have our son. Yeah. And, uh, and I recall, I took, uh, we flew into Cameron Bay on a commercial jet. Wow. On landing in Cameron Bay, here comes a mortar attack. Wow, yeah. <laughs> So welcome. Mm -hmm. And then from uh, there, we went in the train, and I think we did some more training, in-country training at, on an island, Hontre Island. Right. And I was there. And from there, I got assigned uh, down to the fourth uh, Canto, which was in the fourth, fourth Corps of uh, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And I, as an engineer officer, I was assigned with a sergeant to what they call a KB team. And our mission was to uh, fly out of the C team in Canto to the A camps up on the Cambodian border. And our mission was to uh, uh, fortify those camps uh, or uh, if they were got blown away, we'd rebuild them. Right. And we hired all, uh, all native indigenous labor Okay. And I can remember having a CMU machine there. We'd make concrete masonry blocks. Wow. Yeah. With sand and water. Yeah. And that sergeant had all the all the know-how, and I paid. I had the money to pay the labor. Mm -hmm. And I remember we did we did uh, projects at about four or five uh, camps <laughs> up on the Cambodian border. Okay. Working out of two B teams, one in Canto, no, not in Canto, C team was in Canto, and the B teams were in Makwa and in Chilang. So you, as an engineer officer, special forces engineer officer, you were kind of on a B or C team, kind of. I was assigned to the C team, C team. Which, which kind of was building the, the camp infrastructure or rebuilding it as needed, I guess. Up on the border. Right, yeah. And I have some memorable experiences from this one particular camp. I don't know if you know, but in the in the southern part of Vietnam, the Four Corps, it rains a lot there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so our area was flooded a lot. Mm -hmm. And so we had uh, we had those air uh, airboats like they have in Florida. Yeah, with yeah. a machine gun mm -hmm. on the back of it, and uh, that was. That was an experience. And I'm, here's another thing is we had an Arvin artillery in the camp there, and we had sensors up along the border, the Cambodian border, and they looked like plants or some other kind of vegetation. They were mm -hmm. camouflaged. And back in the team house, we had uh, uh, grid coordinates. So every time something moved across the border, we would see the sensor would be beeping on a monitor in the team house. Wow. So we gave those coordinates to the Arvon artillery unit and they mm -hmm. shot it. Mm -hmm. So here's a funny story. A couple of days later, here comes a papa son. He says, you shot my water buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so I had the money and so we had a schedule of how much to pay for damages we, we did to the, the water buffalo. That was funny. Did you did you have any sense that um, you were different as a special forces person than the regular army in Vietnam, or what did you have a sense of? Well, let's see. There were our A teams had twelve personnel, traditional special forces A teams, right. and then there was a Vietnamese team of very analogous to the American team. Right. And they were located with us there in his okay. time. Uh, what else do I want to say? Well, just the way you were, the way you, you know. Just well, we had, 
We, we didn't have much contact with uh, regular okay. military. Okay. Except for, uh, except for when we went on missions, I remember uh, we went on a mission. Sometimes they have these hunter killer teams where there were uh, helicopters and uh, some flying low and then a couple of Apache helicopters mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and gunships. And then the uh, troops were, would be in the Hueys. Right. And they go, they go look for trouble <laughs> and chase them down. And I remember those, they call them Puff the Magic Dragons. We'd had yeah. support from the support. C-130s with the I think the gun the, on the side of them, I think. Oh, the, I could see the tracer rounds coming down. Yeah. We had a lot of yeah. Air Force support. Mm -hmm. In the camp at, at, I was at the B team in Chile in a, sleeping in a hammock. And I recall there was a big mountain there and and the BC were in these tunnels in this mountain. And I recall uh, B-52 stripes on this mountain. They just blow the heck out of it. Wow. The concussion was so strong, it blew me out of my hammock. Mm -hmm. That was a memorial. What so was, was it like, you know, we hear a lot about the A-team and how it works. What, what, what can you tell us about B and C teams and what, what they were like? And well, just... C, C teams was like the headquarters in, the, in that region. Right. That's where the colonel was. Mm -hmm. And we got assigned to our jobs uh, uh, out on on the border by the by the C team. Okay. Now the B teams, there were two of them down south, and and they were mostly they had all the functions S one, S two, S three, S four. Okay. Yeah. And, and all the logistical support mm -hmm. for B teams. Mm -hmm. And I recall, uh, so we would stay there once in a while to get mobilized to go into the A teams. And every time we were doing something, we I had access to a Chinook helicopter, and we took a lot of because uh, all of our construction materials yeah. out to the camps um, with that helicopter. I had one other interesting project. I got assigned. There was a the Navy SEALs were building some uh, dependent housing way down south on by the equator, and I had another project to build. Uh, housing for dependents that were working down there where it was so hot wow. so uh i worked in Canto. we fabricated a lot of the trusses and stuff like there and just hooked it down there so that we wouldn't have to be in that heat <laughs> yeah that was i got a i got a bronze star for that project wow what was it like working with the local populace as a special forces we had Filipino technical representatives there at the, at the C team in Canto. So one electrician, one plumber, one carpenter, and, uh, and they, they were very helpful to doing what we had to do. And they, had, they all lived in villas downtown oh, okay. in, in the city. And so uh, on Sundays, they would have uh, barbecues, and I can recall going there into town and having a great lobster, great barbecues. Wow, yeah. So I was down in Canto doing that for eight months. And then the last four months in, in, in country, I, uh, I got assigned to go back to Natrang, where I became the public uh, utilities, let's see, public, work, public works and utilities officer for the Special Forces headquarters there in the train. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of an interesting job. Yeah. Responsible for uh, maintaining the roads, uh, the electrical service off the generator ships. Right. And all the water and sewer systems. Mm -hmm. uh, maintaining the NCO club and the officers club. Wow. That was a little bit more civilized. I like it much better. We had a bed. <laughs> and uh, custodial services in a room. I was in like a dormitory, mm -hmm. just like living in heaven. Yeah. We did some civil uh, civic action programs too. We take some of our graders, mm -hmm. we'll build soccer fields into into town for the uh, civilians, trying to promote goodwill. 
I'm I'm kind of curious. So you got all that medical training. Did did you end up, you know, either using that directly or indirectly, even though you were an engineer? Um, never used it. Never used it. No, <laughs> it was a great experience, though. Yeah, you yeah. know, a lot of the guys that get out of that program after they're out of the service, they they became physician assistants because yeah, definitely, yeah, and, uh, yeah. It was a good program, good training. I say I was in the army for four years, almost three years in training and one year in the yeah working. <laughs> How um, I'm curious. Um, I mean, you talked about a lot of moves early on, your wife having kids and you're moving. Um, how did you balance the demands of being in Special Forces of Green Beret in, in your family life? My wife did not like it very well. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a college sweetheart mm -hmm. and uh, she wasn't really in favor of any war. She was a flower child, a hippie. We got married in Fayetteville. Yeah. In the park, Rowan Park in Fayetteville. We had one of my classmates uh, there in the park, wrote the boughs, and he was a preacher, so he married us. Wow. <laughs> but uh, let's see, we, we had apartments in, uh, in Fayetteville, and, and we also, I came back from medical school, I had a, an apartment in Spring Lake. Uh, and then finally, that was when I was enlisted, man. And then in OCS, I finally, uh, got housing on the base, officer housing. Oh, okay. she, didn't like, she, didn't, she didn't like that at all either. Right, yeah, yeah. So when I was in Vietnam, she went back to graduate school mm -hmm. and I sent my check to her and she and my son went to, she went, she got her master's degree in social work while I was in Vietnam. Of course, I sent all my money back to her because mm -hmm. didn't need any. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That's about my story. Yeah. After, after I got out of the service, I went back in, on the GI Bill and got a master's degree wow. in uh, municipal administration mm -hmm. at the University of Iowa and uh, had a career for 35 years as a city or town manager. Wow. And then that, after that's a great lead in to. Um... How did, how did your time as a, in special forces kind of influence your your perspective on life? My behavior improved. I, I became out I came out of the service much more mature than I was when I went in there. And so I had the you know I had the uh, uh, anyway I could Is that do, just I could military do my or do you think special forces? in particular had anything to do with that or was it just military like i think both oh i'd say both i was much more mature when i came out than when mm -hmm. i went what was special forces contribution to that maturity you think uh chat accept the challenge get her done right mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. So I did a 35 years career as a city manager in four states. It's kind of a political job. I worked my longest. I was in the, down in the St. Louis area oh, wow. for a while. And then I was, mm -hmm. uh, I ran for the Illinois legislature for state uh -huh. representative. Mm -hmm. I got beat so bad that I decided to get out of there and I moved to Alaska where I was a city manager up there. When were you in Alaska? What years were you in Alaska? Uh, I was there, I think. Uh, 74. 74, okay. To, uh, yeah. 75. And then I stayed up there. I was up there for the first time 18 years and the second time uh, two more years. Yeah. Uh, and that was a great place. I, I got a great uh, retirement plan out of Alaska. Oh, wow. And so the check comes in every month. Oh, is that for the oil? Uh, some, some, some type of thing that anybody that's a resident of Alaska gets yeah. something out of there or something. That's it's called a permanent fund. Oh, okay. After you've lived in Alaska for one year, yeah. you're still there, 
you'd get the permanent fund dividend. And I went up there with six kids. And <laughs> my wife and I and all six kids got that permanent fund check. Wow. And it was over $1,000 that first year. Wow. Right? That, so, that's some good money. Yeah. It's even better now. Yeah. Yeah. How about um, also kind of reflecting um, any learnings you got from being in, like you were in different countries, you were in Vietnam. I don't know if you were in any other countries, but just as a Green Beret, any any learnings from that experience of being around people in, in another country and regions well, of the world? I, I only, Vietnam was my only overseas assignment. Yeah. I think I learned, uh, I think, you know, maybe, I don't know if it's unique to special forces, but how to get along with people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I have a good attitude. I don't mm -hmm. have any depression. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I did. Unfortunately, I did after about six, six or seven months after coming back from Vietnam, like I was not having a problem getting along with my first wife. Mm -hmm. and uh, got married again mm -hmm. and uh, married a gal who was the city clerk in the town in Illinois where I was and she had eight kids so I oh, married a gal with eight kids wow they like to claim great tax deductions <laughs> <laughs> and if you got a great sense of humor uh, yeah, yeah. these yeah. kids are just great and we still vacation and yeah we we have a lot of fun together mm -hmm. um were, they, were there any unique traditions or customs in the Green Berets when, when you were there that, you know, you guys did or that seemed to be unique to being in special forces, rituals, customs, traditions? Uh, you know, I can't recall. All I can recall is we sure had great uh, living accommodations at Fort Bragg. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, from those old, it wasn't those old World War II barracks. Right, yeah. Like, like when we got out of there and went to group or okay. we had a Fort Benning. It just, we had four guys in a room. Yeah. You know, just the uh, relationships and friendships. <laughs> I still have friends. I still communicate with friends that are in training group. Uh, oh, really? There. Wow. Yeah. Um, One guy oh. sends me, sends me uh, cart, cart jokes <laughs> about okay. every couple weeks. Well, if a young person, um, they're kind of closing up here a little bit. If a young person was considering ask you about special forces, what advice would you give them? I'd say go for it. It's a great learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. And if you're if you're looking for goals in life or a career, you know, there's a lot of things you'll learn in, in forces that you, you can transfer out to a civilian employment. Mm -hmm. Even after after I finished my city management career, I became a guest lecturer at the at a regional campus of Indiana University, where I where I taught uh, several courses and I enjoyed working with the students. It was more fun and rewarding yeah. than working with elected officials. <laughs> yeah, I bet. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so now I still. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not teaching anymore, but I still uh, write grant pro, pro bono grants for my hometown where I was the town manager wow. before retirement. And mm -hmm. I think the street department and the parks department get annoyed with me because I get all these grants and they have to plant them. <laughs> they have to do the work to spend the money, huh? Yeah. yeah. Well, Gee. Got the grant trees, but they got to plant them and and care for them. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Was there anything else you'd like to add? Anything we didn't talk about that was important to your time in Special Forces or as a Green Beret? No, I'm looking forward to seeing a copy of this video because I think it would be really nice to play it at my funeral. <laughs> <laughs> I can go along with these. Our town has these, uh, they call hometown heroes. Mm -hmm. They have banners with your photo photo on it, and they're mm -hmm. on all the light posts around town. On oh, the, yeah. My, my, put, put my town on, does that, too. Yeah. For Memorial Day and Veterans Day. So it's, I feel like I've, you know, I've made a contribution, and I enjoy the recognition. 
Are you on one of those banners then? Are I you? am oh. right next to the American Legion line, post. Congratulations. I haven't made it to one of those yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but that's the next thing I'll have at my funeral service, that banner. Yeah. Well, <laughs> hang in there. Life's not over yet. But well, thank you for this interview. Yeah, thank you. Well,